The scientific method is one of the most important philosophies that we have in our modern society. I mean, our whole world is based on science and technology, and that comes from scientists working on ideas and projects that are in many cases counterintuitive. And you have to just let nature tell you what the underlying reality is. And we have a certain way that we talk about science in the scientific method in modern society. What does it mean to have scientific consensus about some idea? What things are facts and what things are just theories? And I, I, I think a lot about this. So anyway, I had a chance to talk with Peter Vickers. He is a philosopher of science at the University of Durham in the United Kingdom. He wrote an article about this idea and he's working on a book about it. And we had a very fascinating conversation about the philosophy of science. How can we trust consensus in science and how can we improve acceptance and even just the scientific method itself? All right, here's the interview. Hi, Peter. How's it going? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Good, good. So uh, for people who don't know who you are, uh, who are you? What do you do? Uh, I've been a lecturer at the University of Durham in the UK now for 10 years. Um, I did do a one-year postdoc over in the States at Pittsburgh. And the focus has always been on philosophy of science, thinking about, I guess, the deeper questions about science. What is science? What does it do for us? How does it work? Can it go wrong? And mainly, <laughs> I guess, what's the relationship between science and truth? So it's always come back to the relationship between science and truth, really. Well, it is interesting that that philosophy and science are, I think, in a lot of people's minds, not related, almost antagonistic. But science is just a form of philosophy. Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you go way back, they weren't distinguished. Uh, and there were certain sort of uh, natural philosophers, as uh, we often yeah. call them, yeah. who uh, were scientists of the day. Um, but they didn't distinguish the two things at all. They were just trying to figure out what is this universe we live in? what What's going on really under the surface? Um, is there a distinction between my perception of reality and reality itself. It's one of the classic questions, which is at the core of both philosophy and actually science. You know, the science we have today tells us that the reality we see is nothing like uh, how it appears. And that's always been, that's often still seen as a philosophical thought, hmm. but actually that's something that science tells us. There are, there's all sorts of things going on um, you know, there's radio waves flying past our, our heads. Obviously, we, you know, we just take these things for granted. Um, and radio waves are a form of light. And we see some uh, wavelengths of light, but we don't see those ones. So there's lots of invisible things. Um, the, you know, viruses, um, space time itself, all sorts of things that actually um, are things that um, are now accepted as part of science, but uh, are also core questions of philosophy, I think. So as a philosopher of science, or a, a, a science philosopher, so like, how do you approach this, this work? Because you're not necessarily doing science, like you're not tr crashing particles together, you're not discovering new methods of biology, you're working on science itself. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, so I started off maybe wanting to be a scientist, and that seemed really hard. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you have to do loads of maths to start with. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I was quite good at maths, so I ended up doing maths and philosophy joint honours. And the maths I did was sort of maths for science. You know, I did topics like electromagnetism, but it was in a maths department, or quantum mechanics, but we studied it in a maths department. And I mean, this was sort of a cheeky way at one time to just make sure I got really high marks. Uh, <laughs> because um, when you do science, you typically, I mean, when I, I started off doing physics, but you did maths as well. You did, you, you did your lab work and then uh, you went and did maths. Um, and it felt like I was doing too much. I mean, it's, it's a tough, uh, I think it is tough to study science um 
for, for that reason, you're, you're typically expected to just be really good at all the maths. Then there's the science as well. Anyway, going into too much detail here, but I, I did sort of straddle both as long as I could, doing some science and some philosophy. Then I went in more into philosophy. But it was this course that was called History and Philosophy of Science. And you sort of look back at the history of science and you try and distill some of the important lessons, maybe. Um, you might say, well, there was a scientific revolution there that nobody saw coming. And does that mean that there's going to be a scientific revolution maybe in the future that nobody now can see coming? You start to think about those lessons and uh, those questions and maybe think, um, are we in a privileged position now where we sort of know, nearly know everything? Or should we look back at history and say, well, actually, um, people used to think that and they were totally wrong. And so we should assume that we are totally wrong. Right. People have declared the end of science many times in the past, sure. uh, hundreds of years ago, <laughs> de yeah. decades ago, today. Uh, how, how do those declarations of the end of science inform your thinking about this? Yeah, sure. I mean, one thing that's happened in philosophy of science is this big fracturing of science. So uh, at the extreme, this means you can't say anything about science because physics is really different to psychology, but they're both sort of coming under this umbrella of science. This is relevant to what you just asked, because you might think that in fundamental or theoretical physics, there's every reason to think there's going to be some big revolutions in the future. Whereas maybe in biochemistry, you might think, no, there's no reason to think that. Um, we know all sorts about, about biochemistry, about how you know sugars work or proteins and so on. We don't expect any revolutions there, maybe. But when it comes to fundamental physics, you might think, well, both, I mean, there are lessons from the past about that, you know, um, and those lessons seem to tell us that our intuitions are useless when it comes to fundamental <laughs> physics. Yeah. Common, sen common sense has to go out the window. So what seems right, you know, may be way off. And what seems wrong may be the truth. And that causes a special problem for um, fundamental physics that some of the other sciences don't have. Um, so, or don't have to the same degree. So, yeah. Um, so one thing that I like to do is think about the different parts of science differently and a, a lot of philosophers will do this now and say that you know it's really hard to say anything general about science you know uh, in capital letters because you know you have to say different things about different subfields how how should we distinguish like like we're in a tricky time in human history right now with the, thanks to the internet and anybody with a connection to the internet can write anything they want and declare it science or attack science. But obviously we need, nature doesn't care. Nature, nature has no interest in our petty squabbles and uh, redefinitions. How, how, where would we draw the line between what is good science and what is not science? Um, I mean, the, the, I guess, annoying answer to that is that there's no obvious line. Mind you, even if there's a big gray area, you can still identify things that are sort of paradigm or exemplar examples of, of what you would call science and things that definitely aren't. I still, I think there's, there's a big gray area. Um, maybe even something like economic theory or some of the social sciences you could put into that gray area where there, there are these debates, you know, is it really science? Often what people are really asking uh, at root is, can we trust what they're telling us here mm -hmm. in the same way we could trust a prediction um, in physics? So, you know, if someone makes a prediction about when the next solar eclipse is going to be, and you think that's really solid, uh, I can trust that. Somebody in economics makes a prediction about something and um, you might be really skeptical, even if lots of uh, pr professional economists uh, agree. Um, and, and then like something like astrology, you might think that's definitely not science. And one of the reasons is the predictions are really um, 
aren't worth anything. Um, mm-hmm. so, so is that it? Yeah. I mean, it is predict is it predictive quality? Is that like the number one thing you're looking for? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I hit upon that there because that's one thing sometimes people want. Um, trustworthiness generally, I suppose, is uh, is a is something that's connected to predict predictions, but doesn't have to be the same thing. Um, how 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 would that be different? Whether you can trust what you're being told, uh, I, I suppose, by the sci- by that community call them a scientific community if you like but um, but I, I don't understand how that affects the science like like if if the scientists are making predictions and they're turning up to be true whether we trust them or don't trust them has no real impact on whether or not they're actually doing science well we might care about the underlying theory that they have so you can have like um a framework for calculating things or for making predictions where the underlying theory is just not true at all. This is something like what Ptolemy had um, mm-hmm. way, the way back before the, before the Copernican revolution. Yeah. The, the epicycles and so on, where you've got like a mathematical framework, which gives you predictions that are somewhat trustworthy um, mm. because, you know, it, it builds it in such a way that, um, by adding those epicycles ad hocly, often um, the it, it built a framework that that could make predictions in a fairly reliable way. So you might say, look here, here's an example of something where you can trust the predictions. But maybe, I mean, obviously, we can say, look, um, the the underle- underlying theoretical ideas weren't trustworthy, at least taken taken literally. So, I mean, you'll get people like that today, maybe maybe that's a classic um, attitude towards physics, where you might say, look, I expect some big revolutions in physics, but the maths just works most of the time really well. You know, we can predict what, um, we can even predict maybe what our own star, the sun, will, how it will develop over the next few billion years. Right. Like you have this situation. I mean, when you think about this problem with quantum mechanics and, and, and gravity in both yeah. are beautifully explained, both theories beautifully explain the, and make predictions of the reality that we observe. The two must interact in this universe that we live in. And yet there is no way that's been figured out so far to be able to bring those two theories together in any way that makes any sense that makes testable predictions. That we can test. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Sure. So, it's an example that sort of pushes some people just towards a sort of a pragmatic attitude towards towards these theories to sort of say, yeah, uh, they work, and that to some people that's what being a scientist is. Let's you know, let's just have problems that we solve, and quantum mechanics is a great tool for solving those for many many of those problems you know if we build this and that can we make this and that work in a certain way um or simply what predictions can we make and test and um maybe general relativity too um the yes i mean we can we can use uh, we can use relativity to make adjustments to um for in in certain space missions or or for how, how satellites work we have to uh we have to adjust the clocks on uh, on satellites because of time time dilation and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, the fact that those don't overlap, or I guess the fact that that we don't know what what the common answer is for both of these realms, isn't that just future us's problem? Like, you know, like they both like we can design computer chips with astonishing accuracy and we can chart the motion of our spacecraft and know our position on earth within a, a meter they work they're sure. science and yeah, yeah. yeah it would be great to know how they overlap with each other but you know maybe we'll never know yeah uh i agree and maybe we'll never know um I think you you can quite clearly distinguish two kinds of people in this world, and also two types of 
scientist. You've got the shut up and calculate scientist out there. And this is somebody who really isn't going to care that those two theories sort of clash with each other in some in some metaphysical or fundamental sense, but is just going to say, um, these theories may be all we ever need to do what we need to do uh, or what we want to do. Um, and yes, there's a program out there to resolve the conflict between them, but we actually don't need that program. Uh, these theories are fantastic uh, as they are as tools. The, the other side of the coin is the person who, who got into science in the first place because they wanted to find out the truth. This is someone like Einstein, you know, somebody or uh, who's Einstein's often called, you know, a philosopher scientist. There's, there's, a, there's a few in history, but I think Einstein definitely wanted, got into science and wanted to know the truth. And, um, and that kind of person almost doesn't care how useful the theories are. They, all they want to know is, how does, what, what is this universe I live in? It's sort of a romantic, I guess, attitude. Um, and that person will be really, I guess, disturbed by, the, um, <laughs> right. by this conflict. Maybe we just need both, though. I mean, I, I, I think the a strength of science is a healthy variation in attitudes. And um, if everybody was really hung up on this clash between quantum mechanics and relativity, you know, that, that, I think that might be a problem. Um, there'd be a... Uh, yeah, two- it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Like, like, I get this question a lot where someone will say, like, how, what came before the universe? And, and I'll be just like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. Nobody knows. And anybody who tells you that they do know doesn't know. They're, they're, they're either lying or they're just making something up that we actually have no evidence for where the universe came from. And, and that uncertainty of living your life with possibly the most important question that, that a philosopher can possibly ask, just hanging out there makes, gives people you know, makes them feel really uneasy. But me, I don't care. I'm totally fine with it. Like, I don't know. You know, like maybe we'll figure it out in my lifetime or maybe we won't. But I'm interested to see the surface of Europa, right? Like I can't wait to see the surface of Europa and I can't wait to to find out how this cell biology works. And it, yeah, and absolutely, if someone would deliver me the the answer to the biggest questions in the universe, I would gladly absorb them and enjoy them. But I'm not going to hold my breath and it's not going to make me upset to wait for them. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's loads of parts of science like uh, writ large where um, these sort of deeper philosophical questions really fade away to some extent. So I've been looking at some missions to Enceladus to sort of explore the ocean underneath the ice there. And that's super exciting. But what do you need to do that? You just need a um, you need a load of really clever engineers um, before you, you don't need the philosophers involved for, for that one. Um, yeah, it's just a, a practical question. You know, can we can we get there? Can we get these machines sort of doing their detective work? If they find life, the philosophers might come in handy, though. Or something that is in between life and uh, non life, yeah. and no one really knows uh, what to call it. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah, they could, they're, 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 there are still sort of deeper questions in the background, which are motivating some of the people who want to drive these missions to sort of say, you know, uh, if we can find a separate source of life just in our solar system, then that would suggest that there's, there's extraterrestrial life all over the universe, you know, um, which, which would be a big deal for just thinking, you know, having that perspective on how, how special are we, um, which I, I, you know, there's as sort of these big questions in the background that have hung over humanity for for centuries. You know, are we really, really special, or are we just not special at all? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, um, uh, now, you came to my attention. You wrote an essay for the conversation fairly recently, and I really enjoyed it. And you talk about the, although th- it feels like the revolutions in science have been unpredictable there are certain themes to the predictions, to the theories that we have that make them, you describe, you use the term future-proof. So what is, what do you mean by that? I mean, the basic, the basic idea is 
to try and hold on to um, a conception of scientific fact where a fact is something that you can have confidence in um, basically forever. I mean, if something's a fact, it's going to last forever because it's articulating a, a truth and the, and the truths aren't going to change. Um, that's that's the idea. And, and I, you know, I suggest some examples that were once theories but became facts. Uh, give, give us an example. So just, I mean, one of the most basic examples is that the sun is a star. So at one time, people thought the sun was really something different and special. And then those sort of fixed stars, as they were called, were a different kind of thing. Then people started to say, well, hold on, maybe those stars are like our sun, but just really far away. But at that point, they had very little evidence to back that up. It was just seemed like a reasonable theory, especially after Newton. Um, and we got this different perspective on the cosmos more broadly. But even, even then, for a long time, it was just a theory that maybe most people signed up to, that, yeah, this, this is just a star, but really near. Um, and um, But, yeah, I mean, through the sort of 18th, 19th centuries, we started to collect data, which started to put it beyond reasonable doubt. And then you sort of get, you know, today you get a generation of people who say the sun is a star yeah it's obvious didn't we always know that and <laughs> we until did. you look at that history you're like no people had people really didn't know yeah. um and it's now it's just a completely accepted uh scientific fact so so you use that term <clears throat> the star the sun is a star and that is a scientific fact but actually the sun is a star that's a scientific theory like if we're going to be rigorous in describing it and that someone could come up with a better hypothesis that explains the sun that makes predictions that allows us to distinguish between the sun and the other stars and the theory that the sun is a star goes out the window and is replaced by something else but you say i don't see it happening <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's there's in philosophy there's this this is a uh, idea of skepticism philosophical skepticism and and this is i mean descartes made this famous this idea that anything can be doubted and and philosophers debate this uh, with their students you know first year students all, all over the world in philosophy 101 um can we doubt literally literally anything and and descartes says yeah you can doubt literally anything without contradicting yourself apart from Kagito ergo sum, uh, I exist. He said, you can't doubt that you exist because as soon as you start trying to doubt it, you know you exist because you're doubting it. Right. It's the ba only, basic idea. Right. Only doubters, else, only existers would doubt. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's, I mean, the, the basic idea is that you, you could doubt that, um, that other people exist because you know, this this could all be my dream, you know, you interviewing me right now. Um, in some weird sense that we don't understand, it could be a, a powerful form of dream that's much more powerful than what we normally call dreams. Or uh, there are other options too. Descartes talks about an evil demon who's actually manipulating my thoughts. So, right. you know, I or really you live in a simulation or your brain in a vat or... or yeah. Or... Sure. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. so, so, you know, the sun is a star. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this and me saying, actually, the sun is a star is a theory. They're going to, they're, mm -hmm. they're screaming right now, yelling at their headphones, shutting off the podcast. Yeah. Um, but these exist, these accepted theories, so accepted that they are considered facts, exist everywhere across our modern civilization we interact with them every day yeah um i mean think about history the field of history is an interest, interesting example where you can there, there are apparently lots lots of facts some of them used to be theories some of them didn't so einstein was a scientist who existed Obviously, it depends you have to be careful about how you articulate it right. someone might say you know was he really a scientist in what sense you i mean but there are ways to articulate uh, think events in the past that people say, well, that did happen. You know, World War One, that that did happen. That's a fact. Um, there are also things that we found out. So, 
you might say dinosaurs once existed. Maybe you want to say that's not history, that's science now. But again, that's another example where something we seem to have accumulated enough evidence that at some point it, be, it becomes beyond reasonable doubt. That's, that's sort of a key phrase that human beings like to use. Is, is that beyond reasonable doubt or not? Uh, you're not saying you've proven it. No way. I mean, you know, you can't yeah. hardly prove anything in this world, as we, uh, you know, as we, as we mentioned. But the idea is that it's crossed some kind of threshold um, where it seems a bit unreasonable to doubt it now. If you are uh, um, sufficiently educated, I guess, I mean, if you think about some like uh, of the tribes that exist out there in the world, of course they don't believe these things, and um, you wouldn't want to say they're irrational for that. Obviously, they they've grown up in a different education system. Um, many people obviously grow up in a certain kind of um, context where they they couldn't be expected to to know some of the things that you and I would say that we know. But but um, you could. You could take a person in one of those tribes and you could go on a fossil dig with them and you could dig up a Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth and they could look at this tooth that is as long as your forearm and go, I don't know of any creature that has a tooth this big. I recognize teeth. That's a tooth. Therefore, there must have been a very big creature that had teeth that were very big. And and it feels like the difference between – is can you interrogate it today? Can you go and look for evidence today to justify this belief? And I, I love that term, the, just the beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, obviously, it works great in the legal sense, but, but it works great in just this. Like, you could just say, I believe all of this stuff – to a reasonable doubt and, and, and call it a day. And I think that's the difference between history that you can't interrogate, that there might be like, as soon as there is no evidence for the, the you know, the Punic war, then it shifts into myth and legend and history and no longer has the evidence that you can use to back it up. Yeah. The evidence becomes weird that such as it exists. So the evidence is, basically what's in the libraries i mean the that historians have, have put together and it may be that the evidence that they drew on has somehow disappeared so they had a manuscript and that informed their thinking and they wrote about it in this book and we still have that book but we lost the manuscript and and so we become perhaps more detached from the original evidence you can also imagine a case where you know, your great grandmother told you something, um, but she died, and and then eventually your grandmother dies too, and then eventually your mother dies too, and so you're you're becoming further and further removed from that original sort of concrete evidence, if you like, uh, because your great grandmother actually saw the thing happen. I mean, you know, it wasn't just evidence; she actually saw it. But now you just have this this sort of evidence that's been passed on, and sometimes that's all we have. Maybe in you know in in the history section of the local library we can we can find some of this evidence that we're sort of three or four times removed f from, but um, we still that I mean it comes down to trust to some extent. Um, you know we might know that the person who wrote this was a really serious historian who cared about the truth, um, and they were embedded in a community that actually held them to account as well. So they couldn't just say anything. They they were being interrogated, and um, this this book was reviewed, and th there's all that going on as well in the background. Uh, when when you think about whether you should believe what some book tells you, um, you know, so so it's, but a it's better, it's a complicated yeah, picture. for sure. But it but it is better when you can go and do a carbon fourteen analysis on the timbers of the ship that they say fought in the war and the dates in the carbon 14 perfectly match the dates in the historical record. Yeah. Then yeah, science that's right. Is, yeah. Is coming back and helping out to confirm a story. Yeah. There can be all sorts of, uh, of, of little threads that, that sort of come together and, and help to build a single picture. And at some point you think, well, there's so many different lines of evidence for, 
for this that um, it has to be true. The, the but the I think one of the key things that I try to um, I try to emphasise in the article to some extent, but also in, in this this book I, I've got coming out is that it's it's about the community as well. So any one of us might think that has to be true, but if, if, if we just think that and most other people think, well, no, actually there's room for doubt, uh, then we might think may, maybe that's just me who sort of crossed the line too early. So, you know, I, I thought it was beyond reasonable doubt, but there were all these people out there who say no. But they, they, the, key, the key thing, I think, is when there's hardly anyone left who, who thinks that it hasn't crossed the line. Um, and in the ideal case, you've, we've got what you call a scientific consensus. E even the people who started out being skeptics, which many scientists often do start out being skeptics, um, you know, e even most of them have decided, actually, the evidence is, is so strong now that uh, I ought to believe this. And I mean, we see this, and maybe this is just a, f a factor of, of our modern again, our internet discourse and the fact that everybody's opinion is being jammed into our brains in real time via social media, etc. But scientific consensus is being used as a pejorative, it's being used as a, as a bad thing. Like if you take your car to 10 mechanics, and they all tell you that your transmission is shot, you have a mechanics consensus from an expert consensus that you probably need a new transmission for your car. Yeah. That's not going to make you, I mean, apart from that, you have to replace the transmission on your car. You're not going to be, you're not going to rail against the consensus of the mechanics. And yet in a lot of these fields that we see with climate change, with COVID, with a lot of stuff that is affecting us today, we're seeing this, this anger at the idea of a scientific consensus. Why is that, do you think? Um, communities are, are funny things and, and knowledge exchange within communities uh, can work in strange ways. And I think we all sort of know that. We've all, we've all seen on social media sometimes how you can, you know, without really meaning to, you can end up in an echo chamber yourself in your own social media because somehow, you know, everybody you're connected to thinks the same way and then you can have an epiphany where you realize actually most people don't think like this it's just me and my group of friends here on social media um when it comes to scientific communities i'm not gonna you know try and make out that scientists are these perfect epistemic agents they're they're not there have been episodes in the history of science where many scientists have been led in the wrong direction. I mean, um, many scientists use trust a lot. So they're not doing the experiments themselves, but they know that this team was a trustworthy team or they think they know they were. And so they take a result on board mm -hmm. as part of their like background information. Well, they, they haven't vetted that experiment at all. They, they haven't tried to repeat it. Yeah. But, you know, they, they're sort of taking it on board or they know that this is an author, this guy's an authority or this, this woman's an authority in the scientific community. So what they, they said X, so X is probably true, you know, um, but that kind of thing right. is happening all the time. And actually, in the case of continental drift, that, that big debate that happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, mistakes were made at the community level. So in the U.S., the U.S. was sort of famous, really, for thinking continental drift could not be true. And some uh, famous scientists like George Gaylord Simpson said that the debate should be closed because we're so sure continental drift can't be true that, you know, we why are we even debating it? And then it turned out drift was true, uh, more or less. Um, the very thing that he was saying couldn't possibly be true. But he was a big authority figure and actually influenced many scientists in the US at that time. So the up and coming generation were being told something that was actually false, mm -hmm. it turned out. Now, yeah, with lessons like that, you can start to think, see how people might think. Um, scientific community opinion can be skewed in all sorts of ways. Um, and you can go too far with that and never trust any scientist about anything, however strong the consensus.
But, um, but I guess, I mean, what it, what it feels like is the, uh, how, like, like people feel nervous to fly on an airplane and yet they know that flying on an airplane is safer rationally than, than the drive they took to get to the airplane. And yet the nervousness is being on the airplane. It's the outliers that stick in your brain as, as a, as a risk for every, uh, Galileo for every, for every continental drift argument, you probably have a thousand, uh, well reached scientific consensus that have happened over time. And, and the, and the, the final facts that they have collected are future proof in this term that you, that you described. And yet it is the outliers and it is the outliers that those looking for controversy feast on and propagate. Yeah. When I mentioned drift there, I mentioned it um, because it's a, a striking lesson from history, mm -hmm. but it's probably, it's probably the, the biggest example out there. Um, and if you asked me for 10 examples of that magnitude where the scientific community went wrong, I couldn't do it. Right. Um, yeah. So, so you're right. Um, but could you give me a thousand examples where the scientific community went right? Given um, time. Maybe. I mean, book, I, you know, no, in chapter, I mean, in, in this book I have coming out, I, in chapter one, uh, there were 30 examples I give. And I give these 30 examples to say, look, these used to be theories and now they're beyond reasonable doubt. And the sun is a, the sun is a star is one of them. They're not supposed to be like, yeah, I'm not sticking my neck out. They're supposed to be totally safe examples of things that we, that we now know um, that were once a theory. So, yeah, I think there are many examples like this. And one of the key things is that in some cases, a consensus formed. But since then, we've developed technologies which can actually look and see the thing that was once merely theoretical. And, and you provide a great example of that about yeah. continental drift. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, proves, it proves the consensus because right. you like can we use can watch the. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Like you, you said in your in your in your article, you say like we can watch the continents drifting in real time thanks to lasers and satellites. Like that number is getting bigger. There is no question that this is happening now. When before it was, you had to look at his, historical evidence and look at the shapes of the plates and so on and 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 so forth. So then, yeah, you know, based on this this idea that a scientific consensus is probably true is probably right. Can we safely live our lives just accepting the scientific consensus all the time? Is that the safe bet? Like getting on an airplane is the safe bet? You know what? Um, we don't yet have, uh, humanity doesn't yet have a really good way of measuring scientific community opinion, um, believe it or not. I mean, it's... There are millions of scientists out there and sometimes we would like to know well what percentage of them believes x and you know it's it's hard you can't ask them right as such you uh, should not, not, you, like, I this mean, you should exist if someone's listening right now this should exist right you 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 every once a year you ask the scientists in a field what are the scientific concepts that they're they're working with and ask them for their consensus each one of them to tell you whether they think the sun is a star, yes or no, whether they think dark matter is a particle or gravity as we don't understand it, and yeah. keep track of historical scientific consensus over time. That would be fascinating. I would love to see that. Yeah, well, don't tell anybody, but I, I'm trying to set this up. <laughs> okay, well then we then then there you go. Let me know how I can help because that sounds that sounds amazing. The, I mean, the, 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 the problem is like the, the way that scientists have been surveyed for information in the past has meant you, you, you send, you know, 10,000 of them a link and it sends them to a survey and they have to fill this survey in and they have to go through these pages that, you know, what do you identify as male or female? What, you are, you're a professor. And the, the, there's quite a few pages to a, to a typical survey, and most scientists just, just don't do it. I mean, um, they're, they're under no obligation to do it. It's just, you know, out of the blue, they get this email saying, please fill in my survey. Um, and uh, 
that's the thing that, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to try and get around that so that scientists can give you an opinion with only, and it only take two minutes of their time. Um, that's, yeah. that's the key thing that we need. And then they'd be more willing to do it, you know, fairly regularly, you know, um, if, if a new virus hits us or a new illness hits us like, like COVID, we, we can send, we, we, we can pull the information and say, uh, at some point and say, is this caused by a virus or could it be something else? And so, maybe get an answer on that. So I interrupted your answer to my previous question, just because I got so excited about this idea. But should I, I mean, you say it's difficult, but I mean, like there are things, climate change, COVID, there's a lot of stuff where the scientific community is attempting to make its scientific consensus widely known. Yeah. I should I just, more more. should I just accept it? Oh, should, I, should you just accept it? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I went into that was because um, I think you should accept it when it crosses a certain threshold. You never get 100%. So that's, that's, that's the first thing. So you're never going to wait for all scientists to agree. I mean, if I sent around um, this question, does smoking cause cancer? I, I don't think you would get 100% because some scientists don't believe in causation. Um, they, they, I mean, they, it's, you know, you, I think you'd get a small percentage. You might get 99% or nine, who knows, but, um, consensus can't mean hundred percent. That, that, that's a starting point. Consensus also can't mean like 70% because 30% is a very large number of scientists and for 30% to not agree to something, it would have to mean that they've got good reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, so so the right sort of measure has got to be somewhere between, you know, sort of 70% and 100%. So I've been trying to sort of um, think for myself, you know, how, how could you have put a, a value on this? So what I end up arguing uh, in this book is um, there's not going to be one right place to, to draw the line, but if you get to 95%, then you can be sure. Um, I'm not saying that's the point at which something becomes a fact, but um, but if something does reach 95% consensus, then I think you can be sure at that stage, as long as the community doesn't have some obvious bias to it. Um, mm -hmm. And and most scientific communities, I mean, if if it's in, if it's an international community, which mostly it is, and it's it's a large community then it's going to have enough sort of diversity within it such that a consensus is remarkable. I mean, it's, it's, it's happened for a really, really good reason. It's happened because there's loads and loads of good scientific evidence that's accumulated. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess in the US, um, you know, if you talk about bias in a community, I mean, would it be fair to say that people think of the US scientific community as as made up of Democrats more than Republicans or something like that. And they think that that's problematic. Well, I don't know. I'm Canadian. So, you know, <laughs> um, okay. but, but um, so, I mean, I think that for a lot of people listening to this, they hear me say, you should just trust the scientific consensus. That's the right move. Learn what the, like if you want to, if you want to save a ton of time in your life, mm -hmm. find out what the scientific consensus is. Right now you have to do the hard work. Maybe eventually you can use Peter's handy database and figure out what the scientific consensus is. And then just, and just, and then just accept it and live your life. That's the time saver. That's the way for greatest success. Should you eat fatty foods? Check the scientific consensus. Should you get your COVID vaccine? Check the scientific consensus. Uh, should you believe that dark matter is or is not a particle? Check the scientific consensus. But that's yeah, going mean, to drive people crazy because they're going to feel like they're losing agency. Yes. What are we? So are they right? A lot of the time, like when, when whenever I discuss climate change with a skeptic, um, they actually know a lot of information um, and they can throw all sorts of things at you uh, about sun cycles or, you know, um, the, the history of like ice ages um, and so on. 
this this is a person like you know hypothetical person but there are many people like this who likes to think for themselves right it's um intellectual independence for all this is sometimes called this is this this, this was once like a, a dream that we will have education establishments which allow every individual to be uh intellectually independent if they want to find something out they can go they've got the skills to go out and find it we're all researchers that's the idea um but the the problem it comes i mean i i know people won't like this but yeah the problem does come when uh, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing and uh, many of the climate skeptics i've talked to they know quite a lot about ice ages but but they they can't compete with somebody whose job it's been uh to be a, be an expert on that especially when that person's been embedded in this scientific community where every opinion is held to task um at conferences and in the literature and in peer review so um you have these situations where a little knowledge uh is is, is a dangerous thing because it, it feels like you've done the research but really uh by the standards of professional science you haven't right and, and that idea that that you as a skeptic have not done the research properly you've not done good science disqualifies you from the conversation and again, people are going to hate to hear me say that, but, but, um, but I think that, that like, you're going to cherry pick evidence. You're going to, you're not going to look at evidence. You're going to be not rigorous in this, you know, like there's a, there's a way that science gets done and to not do the work in that manner is to try to shortcut the process. And the downside is, is that you are now opening up massive opportunities for you to have made a million mistakes in your final yeah. conclusion. And you're arguing with a person who has done it rigorously, done it properly. And it really just comes down to nah, uh nah, -uh, right? Quick, quick, little, little correction. You're not arguing with a person who's done it properly. You're you're arguing with this massive community structure, this sure. framework. Sure, sure. No, you're arguing. Sure. No you're arguing. individual scientist can say, "I get to think my, for myself because I'm really clever," but you don't. Each individual scientist has to do the same because no, no, no individual is in a position to have done all the experiments, to have analysed all of the literature. I mean, in some fields, there's a new paper coming out every 30 seconds. I mean, everyone's specialized. The scientists are really specialized. You've got this specialist here who just works on sedimentology, just knows a lot about mud or, you know, or something. This person fits into this huge structure. And when that person asks themselves, you know, what do I believe about climate change? Even though they're a professional scientist, they too have to give up on the intellectual independence idea and um, trust the system, I guess. The system is trustworthy be because it's uh, because of these the, the, these examples we talked about earlier, uh, hopefully where, yeah, um, consensus formed and then it was proven to be correct later down the line. But but the counter to that is that is that skepticism is the hallmark of science, that skepticism is one of the most important states of mind to go into the scientific process. And so when a person comes at it from a skeptical point of view, that is to be celebrated. That's their that that instinct is science and and where do they go wrong? That instinct is yeah, is scientific. Um I think it's good for you to be embedded in the scientific community. And, and that's a long process. So, you know, you start going into that community, maybe when you're 20, just imagining a scientist, you know, career development here. And you're going to conferences and, and, and you're sort of learning, learning how, how it works. Um, if, if you're sort of independent, then you don't have that framework to support you and to help you, uh, I guess, improve as, as a thinker within that community. Uh, but still, scientists can go wrong as well. Um, there's, um, 
at uh, the the GSA conference each year, the the Geological Society of America, they have this session which is on unconventional ideas and outrageous hypotheses. They they have this session because they want to give scientists a chance uh, to express their ideas that were unconventional. The problem is that people who don't like these ideas might not go to that session, or probably won't go to that session. So, um, there are, there, I mean, that's just one example of an echo chamber effect that can happen even within scientific communities. Um, and one of the hallmarks of science is also to be open minded and to, to listen to everybody in the conversation, I guess. Um, yeah, and, I mean, uh, I mean, you you provide this example of of you know, interesting ideas. And I, and I think that's great. I mean, I love, I love to ask scientists, what is a less accepted idea that you love for whatever reason, because I think that's where the creativity comes from. But I think the difference is that, as you say, they have done the work. They, when you say embedded yourself in the scientific community, at the very least, they understand the current state of the science. And so if they're looking to overturn Einstein, the first thing, if you said, okay, fine, like if you think you, you can overturn Einstein, first, recreate all the work that Einstein has done to show me that you understand it. And they'd be like, no problem, here, you know, here's the math, right? This is what Einstein says. And you could show it to a bunch of physicists, they say, yep, that's that person knows Einstein backwards and forwards completely thoroughly. And then you can say, okay, and what's your new idea? And they'd be like, well, here's the math, right? And they they did show it, building on Einstein's theories, replicating all of Einstein's theories, but also making new predictions that are testable. It's that, can you describe Einstein's work first, that the skeptics are unwilling to put in the effort? Are they lazy? I know, not at all. Um, it's... I mean, the, the, I think there once was a time in many fields where you could learn pretty much everything you needed to learn um, if you worked hard. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. So you, you have to specialize. I mean, the the sort of the, the genius who comes along, you know, every every once in a while and somehow needs seems to know, um, you know, all of this history and why we've got to where we are now and the current theories um you know what string theory is doing what loop quantum gravity is doing and can somehow see it all i mean maybe once in a blue moon someone comes along like that um but um it, the the flip side of that is that even the best geniuses in the history of science uh, have, have often or i think maybe always made a silly mistake somewhere and this this idea that we should wait for a genius and follow what they think is is um, well, I argue, not not nearly as reliable as trusting the scientific community. So it's um, it's like the power the power of many minds. I, I, I suppose it's going to trump any any individual who thinks they can uh, they can come along. And so you're you're better off be embedding yourself in this in this in this sort of time tested framework than than trying to be that intellectually independent researcher. I mean, I think the the independent researcher, the skeptic, the person who says, I don't think that st the sun is a star. Like, I think that instinct is noble, that skepticism to say, I there's this long held scientific belief, and I think it might be wrong. And I think that's wonderful. And I think we should encourage that level of skeptical thinking at every level of what we hold to be a scientific truth. But when you set off on that journey, you have to you have to recognize that you and I, I have to use another analogy that you know, if you're going to climb a mountain, you're going to get to the top of a mountain that's never been climbed before you have to recognize the first step is to climb as tall as the person who already got as far as they could. Like, like step one of, of this is for you to understand the science as deeply as the people who understand it at the top of their field. That is your, that's your ante, that's your way from going. And then if you still have those skeptical beliefs, then press on, uh, hero, adventurer, but you yeah. probably won't. 
you'll probably get to parody with the other scientists and go, mm, okay, I see what they're saying. I get it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information out there. And um, I, I recently read this book by Coin, Why Evolution is True. I don't know if you've read that, but it's, it's, an, ama- it's an amazing book where it just tries to condense, you know, all of these decade, decades of, of work of, you know, collecting all kinds of evidence that evolution is true. And, you know, it's a sort of an impossible task, but he does a pretty good job of it. And I did think at the end it would be really curious for a, a, a proper skeptic to read that book and still come out the end saying, I've taken all of that on board. Yeah. And I'm still really, you yeah. know, not, not, impre- not yeah. impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, if you have a climate skeptic and they say, you know, like, I think that, you know, I disagree about whatever climate change, whatever. And you're like, did you read the IPCC report? No. Why not? Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't like it. I, you know, I hate words. Reading is hard. Um, I found this other. I found this. I found this blog post that I found very convincing that told me not to read it. Mm. And 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 like, how can you take that seriously as an argument, as a response? There are different kinds of skeptics, I guess. I mean, you've you've, you've always got your hard skeptics out there who are never going to believe anything. Uh, well, they're going to make their own mind up and, and not really interested in, in what you have to say. They might think that, you know, you, you're a thoroughly biased person and you don't even realize it. You know, you've just fallen into a trap where you've accepted all of this stuff that you don't really understand. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the people in between. Uh, there was a really nice paper recently where somebody tried to show that consensus announcements influence people's opinions and actions because there are a lot of reasonable people out there who do think that scientific communities do work really hard to try and work stuff out and and they do think that if all the scientists agree then that's that is a reason to to believe or to act in a certain way Mm -hmm. but sometimes that communication of what the scientists um believe or the strength of the scientific community belief is is not very transparent so what this paper did is it it showed that what people believed about scientists' beliefs, in this case about vaccination, they they didn't realize how strongly scientists agreed that Mm. most of the vaccines are safe for most people, you know, basically. Um, So they did this experiment where they had two two groups where they gave this group all of these consensus uh, information and and this group they didn't and this group... um, they, they, they did uh, act on that. So, I mean, they're, they're the kind of people, there, there are people out there who you can, who you can reach, I, I guess. Um, and one way to reach them is not to tell them more science, but to tell them more about the strength of the scientific community feeling. Um, and often, you know, that, I think that's what's lacking because uh, the science is actually really complicated and you can lose people really quickly um, talking about, what how vaccines work and and why exactly we we think they're they're pretty safe even though we've never really used them before you know it um but yeah you can take this other route which uh i i call second order evidence it's evidence about evidence you know if there's a really strong scientific consensus that is evidence that there's loads of first order scientific evidence uh to support the idea yeah yeah, I, it, I, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, again, sort of formulating my brain around this, this same idea. So I feel like I'm starting to get, kind of go in circles, which is good. I, I, you know, just this idea that, that the lazy person's approach to living in this modern age is to accept the scientific consensus, um, which again, sounds like a very dangerous thing to say foolishly dangerous and yet the same person hops on an airplane and flies halfway across the the world that we use our phones we trust our airbags like we just live in this world that we trust the scientific consensus just all the time without even thinking about it and it's only in weird edge cases do we does it cross into our vision and we start to have arguments about it but most of the time most of the people live most of their lives deeply trusting in the scientific consensus with their very lives. 
here we are. Yes, true. And and I mean, the 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 only thing uh, that I would add is that this term scientific consensus does have a power to it, and it will be abused because mm-hmm. of that. So yeah. you will find people saying out there in all sorts of places on the internet that there's a scientific consensus when there isn't. Or in some cases, people think there's a consensus, but that's only because of some kind of echo chamber effect. So everyone they know uh, says that scientists believe X. Um, but for some, you know, if you really measured the entire community of scientists' beliefs, maybe only 70% of scientists actually believe that. You know, so you can find you can find a lot of scientists, thousands who believe it, but it's still 70 percent. You know, may, maybe that's not. definitive. Yeah. How could we make the scientific consensus better if that is is the most useful to, tool for us as regular people to live our lives, to navigate this complicated world? How could we make or how could scientists make the scientific consensus better? You mean um, m- more transparent? People can see what people believe. It, whatever, or? whatever is wrong with it, whatever seems to because it, you know. Again, if as I mentioned earlier, people see this, the scientific consensus as a pejorative. They say, "Oh, I, I, I kind of believed in your global warming until all scientists said they thought it was happening, and now I don't believe it anymore because of the scientific consensus." Don't tell me what to think, man. How can science, government, educators, who knows, make this idea of the scientific consensus more trustworthy, back to your original term? Science is becoming a bit more homogeneous. I mean, sometimes scientists sort of growing up in Japan will be using the same textbook that someone in Canada is using, you know, to learn physics. If science became too homogeneous, then you would kind of have a point that there's there's one way of thinking in the scientific community. What makes the consensus really trustworthy and remarkable is when you've got this huge diversity of perspectives within that community. But, you know, in the cut and thrust of scientific debate, they've all agreed that, you know, um, COVID is caused by a virus or face masks actually do um, limit the spread of of an illness or you know whatever it is whatever it is um so we need to preserve the diversity in the international scientific community and i and i think when we make consensus announcements we do have to go to the trouble of saying here's the strength of the consensus Mm -hmm. you need to evidence that somehow which is not too easy um and also go to the trouble of getting a representative sample of scientists from all different backgrounds and all around the world so you can say there's a huge amount of diversity in this in this uh, community, but not, that notwithstanding, they've they've reached uh, such and such agreement um, because the strength of the of the evidence is so strong. So there's, I think there are some things we can do. Yeah. So like whenever we have a press release or whatever, you just have that giant disclaimer with the numbers added. I mean, in the perfect world. You're, you've got some kind of augmented reality goggles that you're wearing or that as you're experiencing the earth and as someone says to you, I heard that smoking doesn't cause cancer and then and then a little footnote pops up and in the field of view that says, this is probably not true. 99% of physicians agree that smoking causes cancer and you can decide whether you want to argue with your friend or not, but at least you know that what they're saying is is against the scientific consensus and you move on, but we're not there yet. It's on us as individuals to take a claim that we are, that we hear and process it in that way and get to our understanding of the nature of the scientific consensus. And in some health claims, there's no scientific consensus and you can almost feel free to ignore it. I mean, that's a question. If there is no scientific consensus, uh, you know, the antioxidants in blueberries will lengthen your life in some health article. Can you just ignore it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, we've been talking a lot about these cases where maybe the, the, there is a scientific consensus. In most cases, there won't be, or at least, it, you know, 
But it could still be interesting to see, are scientists 50-50 or are these 70-30? Um, and at least that could inform your decisions. But I mean, I guess that's where you really have autonomy, where you can say, look, um, the, nobody really knows this. And um, I'm, I'm free to make whatever decision I think is best. Um, and um, there's still going to be a lot of uh, situations like that. So it's, this isn't a case where we all become sort of governed by these rules. You know, science says this, I must act this way. You know, like, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a massive threat to, to, to a person's autonomy, um, this, 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 this idea. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're right. So uh, now you, if people want to follow your work, what is the best day way, best way to do that? Where should they go? Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm sorry. At Pete, <laughs> at Pete J Vickers. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's a strange it's a strange place, but uh, I'll I'll announce most of my stuff there. But yeah, I mean the the big book is is coming out on November thirtieth. Um, That's great. So what's what's the book? Uh, it's called Identifying Future Proof Science. So. Um, the book sort of does in 200 pages what that um, article tries to do in a thousand words. Um, yeah. And uh, a lot of what we've been discussing here uh, is sort of from that book. So, uh, yeah, the idea is to find a way to identify future proof science, despite whilst being fully aware of all these cases from history where scientists thought they knew something and then they were wrong. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Um, yeah, that's the idea. Well, Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about this concept, and hopefully it's given people some new tools to think about. And uh, I look forward to your book coming out. I had no idea you were working on a book. This is Normally people come to me after they've written a book, but but uh, I somehow f sussed it out and reached out to you before I even knew there was a book. And I really look forward to the the database and future augmented reality app that will allow us to just filter all of human reality according to the scientific consensus. Exactly, yeah. Watch this space. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Fraser.